This is Amateur Logic, episode 144, for June 15th, 2020. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com. And by ICOM. Get out and be active with the perfect QRP companion, ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. I'm Emil. And I'm Mike. And it is great to be back with you again tonight. This is, what is this, episode 144. So that means there's been more than 143 before this. Because we didn't count all of them. You know, some some of them. So, hmm. Might be expensive to count that high. <laughs> uh, it is, but if you only do it once a month, it nobody notices. Oh <laughs> uh, well, tonight we've got some fun things going on. Before we get into that, though, because we wouldn't want to have all the fun all at once right here. You need to pace yourself. Yeah, do need to do that. So, we want to mention a couple of things, and what do we want to mention? Well, one is this right here. We've got a chat room anytime that we're streaming live. It's at amateurlogic.tv slash chat. You can join in there. There's a group of folks in there having a good time, and they've been telling dead jokes. <laughs> That's always a good time. Yeah. First, let's just see what everyone's been up to and what they might talk about tonight. Tommy, what's been going on over there on my left? Oh, you mean you're right? Oh, uh, yeah. Depends on where you're sitting. Your other left. Yeah. I've just been I've been playing radio a good bit since I've been home so much. Uh, I've done several projects that I've been wanting to do and. Uh, I actually got a couple segments in the works, but I got a fun one. So my shoulder right here, I'm going to show you guys about here shortly. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, interesting. that is a fun one. I, I have not watched it myself yet, but I know what it is, and I'm looking forward to it because I have several um, several things on my shelf. And, and this awesome. gave me a little inspiration. Maybe I will pull one of them out and put it to good use email what's been going on up there down there uh oh that's right we're backwards again yeah. all right down in the south um we it's all about uh you know we survived tropical storm crystal ball or crystal ball crystal nah, okay we survived it, it was a good wake-up call for us and um, gave us lots of opportunity to make sure everything's working for the rest of the season because they say it's going to be an active season for us. So we're ready, and hopefully we never have to use it, but if so, we're ready. And that's what it's about for me, uh, Preparation H, as we call it here, for the Hurricanes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheap, cheap preparation. <laughs> and I can't take credit for that because George George did it. It was his fault. Yeah. Well, it it was just sitting there presenting itself. I had to I had to bring it up. <laughs> That's Mike, what's going on down here? What's going on over there? Well, I I thought I'd have. You know, during this uh, uh, stay at work at home business, I thought I'd have extra time uh, to get things done uh, hobby wise. But 
you know, now that the nice nicer weather is here um, and the rain, it keeps making the grass grow. So I don't really get a chance to do any hobby stuff. I'm I'm too busy doing yard work and and landscaping stuff. So um, yeah. Um, speaking of weather, it it our high was 55 degrees Fahrenheit today, and I think it's only about 53 degrees. I'm not sure what it's going down to and that's about uh, 12 uh, celsius for for us metro people but uh that's uh, kind of chilly this time of year you notice i'm wearing uh, long sleeve shirts um still because uh you almost need a late jacket when you're outside in this kind of weather wow yeah 55 that's kind of cool it has i don't know it's been in the 80s here i believe most of the week and I don't know if it got to 90 this week, but the humidity has been low the last two or three days. It's felt a lot better. Uh, it's going back up, though. So, you know, that's that's just the kind of the way it is down here in the south. Well, it'll probably spike in a couple of weeks since because it's field day coming up. True. Oh, don't get me don't get me wrong. We've we've had a couple of mini e waves, and uh, two days ago. Um, the humidity was so bad, and I think we're in the mid to high high 80s uh, Fahrenheit, which is warm for us for this time of year. And we seem to get a few days of that, and then we're back down into the uh, the real cold temperatures. Um, so I'm kind of waiting for things to level off so I can get some antenna work done. Yeah. Well, it, it has more or less leveled off here, except... It has been raining every day, and like you were saying, it really makes the grass grow. I I got a whole bell off my front yard yesterday. <laughs> so, yeah, no. quite, uh, well, I could do without cutting grass for a while. I don't think it's supposed to rain next week, so maybe, maybe I'll get a little break there. I've got some work I need to do out in the swamp, you know, I've got some issues at the doghouse or the antenna tuning unit for the 50 kilowatt transmitter and that's that's sitting out in a swamp and grass you know saw grass not regular grass <laughs> about this high email i think probably knows kind yeah, of conditions but, but let's just say the humidity doesn't help that any it doesn't and the fact that we've just had a tropical storm and then uh, a lot of rain another day since then. The swamp is flooded. And, and you know, I'm, I'm having trouble draining the swamp. But uh, I've got to go out there next week and do some work on that uh, on that doghouse. So. Uh, it got a few dry days, though, so uh, maybe we'll have a little luck with that. Well, there is a big contest going on this weekend for amateur radio. And as a matter of fact, I I did some checking a while ago to see what what my uh, 40 meter off center fed dipole looked like on six meters. And let me just say it it doesn't look very good on six meters. And the smoke coming out of the tuner was even you know more of an indication <laughs> that I wasn't going to be able to use it. Uh, but what is the contest going on this weekend, Tommy? I think you've got some information on that. Yeah, I got a little thing from the ARRL. It's There's a link at ARRL.org slash June uh, hyphen VHF. And uh, there's a contest going on for VHF and UHF for amateurs in the U.S. and Canada and their possessions to work as many amateur stations and as many different two degree by one degree maidenhead grid squares as possible using authorized frequencies above 50 megahertz, so that's the six meters and up. Stations outside the U.S. and Canada and their possessions may work the stations in the U.S. and its possessions in Canada. All legal modes are permitted, permitted while CW and single sideband phone are most common. MSK 144, FT8, and FM only are gaining popularity. Uh, other popular modes include PSK31, PS FSK441, which I've never even heard of, uh, and JT65. Anyway, digital mode should be represented as DG. 
Um, there, there's a good write-up on there. If you follow that link, uh, awrl.org slash June dash VHF, you can find a lot more information about it. Um, that's actually this coming weekend. So if you're watching the live stream, you'll get this in time. But if you wait, if you've seen it on the recording, then it's probably over by now. Yeah, I'm going to try to work some this this weekend after I get this video edited, posted. I would like to get on there and uh, try to make a few contacts. And I was hoping to do six meters because my amplifier just happens to work on six meters. Uh, but did you? Did you say, uh, Tommy, did you say um, the FSK441? Is that what? Yeah. Yeah, so ask me how I know what that is. How do you know what that is? It, I believe it's on the extra test. I've been studying, right? And uh, it's the media scatter mode in that suite okay. of um, apps. So that's, well, on, that's, apparently that's on the test. Sometime. And I may have a ham college refresher coming up on it sometime in the very near future. So thanks for that tip. All right. Sounds like you will. Well, email, have you got a, a bona fide email tonight? I have an email <laughs> from Emil. <laughs> Actually, not from Emil. It's from uh, a new, well, a new licensed ham who's been watching awesome. this for about three to four years. He finally got his ticket. Um, KC3PEM, Chip in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He says, um, hi from Pittsburgh. My name is Chip. I caught you on the Southeast Hurricane Net tonight on D-Star. As soon as I heard your voice, I knew who it was. Must be something about my voice. I, get, I got a kick out of hearing you officially on the radio as opposed to YouTube. I followed you, Tommy and George from Amateur Logic for going on three to four years now. He said, I just got my ticket past month when they started allowing the testing online. So there you go. Uh, he's been stuck at home for reasons we won't mention and finally got his ticket. So he did it. Uh, still getting his feet wet on the radio. So he hasn't really started talking too much, but he just wanted to say hi from a fan. So have a great Holiday says so seventy three. I think that was back on the Memorial Day. So, the uh, there you go. We got a a, a new a new ticket at hand. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, welcome to the hobby, Chip. And it's an expensive hobby. <laughs> yeah. Only if you're not the cheap old man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and he's doing it right. He's he says he's hasn't talked much yet. That makes me think he's listening. And that's that's good, you know, to listen a little bit rather than just jump in and start talking, because um, yeah. then you got a better idea of how the conversations go, and uh, you know. Yeah, where, where well, you don't are. just get in too much of a habit of that, because uh, I know of some that just listened and they never really picked up the mic hardly at all. Oh, you mean so you got to get past that mic right part? Huh? That guy. <laughs> oh, not that guy. <laughs> I was, yeah, you ought to know better. I talked to you when I got my handy talkie for first day. I got as soon as I got the battery charged up. Well, that's true. Yeah, and that was that was before you had your ticket, wasn't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I actually uh, Jim, you know our friend Jim that w started the show with his N5 SPE. He and I actually passed our test. And bought rigs, and sat around another month waiting for our tickets to come in. So we had to sit there and listen for a month before we could, you know, before we could talk. So now I I misunderstood you because I did buy my radio before I, my ticket came in. I passed my test, and I bought the radio, but I didn't talk on it. I thought you were asking me if I talked to you on it before my ticket came. But I didn't. I did not do that. But I did listen before. Okay. Well, I, you know, when you said you charged the battery and talked to me. Um. Anyway, not not to dwell on that because I remember it. Those were fun times when you first get licensed. Uh, oh yeah. You know, it it's exciting. And it's still fun times, but really exciting at that point. Okay, tonight. I can hardly. Stand the suspense. Why don't you go ahead and tell us what it is 
you've been working on, Tommy? Yeah, I've, I've uh, got a ham clock. Uh, Emil had one, and I, uh, Elwood Downey, uh, WB0OEW, I think was his call, sent me an email quite a while back about it, and somehow or another, I feel bad because I let it slip through the cracks. But anyway, it came back up. I, I found it and uh, went ahead and did the, put it together. Well, I compiled the code and got it running. Um, but anyway, let's watch the video and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it afterwards. You guys have seen the ham clock Emil did. It's very nice, uh, great functionality. Well, I've got one as well that I've been using on my Raspberry Pi back here with an HDMI monitor. This one was made by Elmwood Downey and it's very versatile. He's got a great website that shows you exactly how to build it, how to compile the code and everything. It's uh, It can run on a Raspberry Pi in desktop mode, which is my preference because I share this Raspberry Pi 4 here. I do some other ham things with it. And then I've also got my Rig Pi station server, my MFJ1234, that I will be putting it on there. I've been doing a lot of digital modes and stuff, and that's kind of becoming my ham radio computer so I'm going to put it on there too. Elmwood Downey made this one. It's very versatile. It can run standalone on a Adafruit Hesba board. I'm probably pronouncing that really wrong. Uh, with a display as a standalone device. It can run on a Raspberry Pi as a standalone device using the HDMI port. It can also run on a Raspberry Pi in desktop mode, which is what I choose to do. So let's go ahead and download the code, build the executable and run it and do a little quick walkthrough. It's, it's super easy. It's basically copy and paste. For the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to uh, VNC to my Raspberry Pi over here so I can record the screen on this computer so you can see. Uh, this is a weird resolution. It's an old monitor that I had that I've uh, recycled from uh, repo repo claws like uh, meal has but anyway it's only 1368 by 768 or something like that it's a weird resolution so it doesn't record very well Elwood's call is uh, WB0 OEW again he's done a great job with this clearskyinstitute.com slash ham slash ham clock and capitalization matters if you try to go to the website but if you scroll down you'll see he's got uh, a lot of information about uh, where to download the code, some FAQs, uh, which displays you can get, some stands, some of his that he's put together, um, how to operate it. There's a PDF here with a little bit of an instruction manual. But we're going to focus today on the desktop version here, uh, which is going to run on my GUI for my Pi. These are the supported resolutions, 800 by 480, 1600 by 960, 2400 by 1440, well you get it, and then almost a 4K resolution. So today we're going to try to do it on our GUI. So what we're going to need to do is run these commands right here, and this will download the code, unzip the package, change to the folder that the unzip routine is going to make, build the executable and run it. So we're going to need a terminal to do that so I'll just run my little handy terminal here and let's first start off by downloading the source code and you can see it's just as easy as copy and paste so we're going to copy that go back over here right click it paste it and hit enter and it's finished. Next one we're going to unzip it copy paste. You can see it's unzipping. Next let's change to the folder that it created. So we'll copy that command. CD is change directory. Paste. Hit enter. And you can see our working folder changed right here. Next we need to build the executable. because So we just downloaded source code. We need to actually compile a program. And don't worry you don't have to be a programmer for this you just need to continue copying and pasting and you're good to go again we're going to build this one if you want to try the standalone one there's instructions down here for that if you want to use dedicated hdmi and if you decide you want it to automatically start into that mode there are instructions for that here too so he's covered pretty much everything let's continue with our build so i'll go ahead and 
grab this command, copy, paste. Now we're letting it build. It just takes just a few moments. Done. That was pretty quick. It only took about 20 seconds to go through that. Next, we're going to run it and see what it looks like. And to do that, we'll just take this command right here. Paste. We'll put in our own call sign, our own location, uh, latitude, longitude for this station. The cluster information, if we want to use a DX cluster, uh, Wi-Fi information, if we're running in standalone mode, be sure we connect to Wi-Fi and can get data for, for the DX cluster and so forth. So I'll go ahead and put my call sign in and I'll just backspace and type this in. If you're running standalone, you can use this keyboard down here by using the touch screen if you want to, but I'm going to prefer to just type that in. Okay, and I, I just know my stuff here is 32.27 north. And a tab took me to the next place by longitude. And this is 90.63 west. And if you're in the UK or anywhere but the United States, you can pick metric, but I'm going to pick imperial. If you pick IP geolocate it'll try to determine from your IP address what your location is but I'm gonna do mine because it doesn't actually get mine exactly right and I do want to use the cluster and I'm gonna use the one that he used in the example dxfun.com and the port is 8000 and I don't need to worry about Wi-Fi because I'm using the Wi-Fi that's set up on my Raspberry Pi done and it's going to go through this check everything for you you can skip that if you want to it brings the clock up so let's go ahead and make it full screen you can see if i go full screen that it doesn't actually fill the screen up that's why you'll need to build it for your resolution and i'll go back and show you those options here in just a moment matter of fact i won't make it full screen i'll just make it slightly larger let's take a tour around if you go up here, you can click on it and change the color schemes, If you depend on where you click. Okay, so you've got the current time, UTC up here, the date. We've got sunspot number. If you click on this, it changes to the solar flux. If you click on it again, it changes to the Voice of America. I forget what that stands for. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, a rating system for the different bands for propagation planetary kp go 16 array a lot of this stuff i'm not familiar with there we go that's dx cluster that's the one that i like the best it shows that it's from dxfun.com we've got the uh, picture of the sun up here which i think that's calculated from some of the data i'm not totally sure about that we got the north california dx foundation beacon project here and you can see this beacon is on 14100, and you can go look and see where the triangle is to match up the colors. Um, 21150 right here. So you can tune to those and check the propagation. That's pretty nice. One thing that's really cool, if you build the standalone one, you can put a light sensor on there on your uh, Arduino or your Pi, I believe, and it'll actually adjust the brightness of your display. Not sure if that works for the Pi, I'll have to look into that. But it does adjust the brightness of your display. And if you click over here, if you have that, then it will uh, show you what the level is. Down here, we've got the current station. We click on it, we've got the time stuff. Down here, we've got DX. If you click on something, it uh, shows you the section that you're in. We've got, if we click over here on DX again, it brings up the satellite list and you can pick a satellite to track and you can see right here that it's it's on its way six minutes and 23 seconds actually and it shows you the path it, this is where it is right now and this is the path that it's taking if we were going to try to listen for it we could see once we're in that circle we should be able to go outside when we have line of sight to the sky and hopefully pick it up if we wanted to we've got uh, rss feed down here if you turn that on 
it shows you the DX News RSS feed. We've got the moon, the phase of the moon, and where the moon is at the moment. If we change here, we've got this flat picture of the Earth. If we change it, we have get the global one, or the circular one, and you can see the direct path of everything. Uh, we can turn on the markers for the latitude, longitude, Let's go look at the compile options real quick. If you want to build it for a different size, it's, it's really easy. I can show you the options. So let's go ahead and bring up another terminal since this one is running our program. If you want to know where you are, what folder you're in, it's usually right here, but you can type PWD for your working directory. Uh, LS brings up your directory and we want to go to ESP ham clock. So let's show CD space ESP ham clock. Capitalization does matter here. And LS, we can show you all the files in there. This one is the one that we built that we're actually running. But we just want to look at the make option. We can type make help if I spell it right. So let's say we want to build it for a larger display. We've got a lot better, better one than the one I've got here. I copied the make command again. We'll paste it. And we can see if we want to build it for 1600 by 960, we would just type, go make J4 ham clock dash 1600 dash 960 and hit enter. Let's do that and hit enter. Helps if I type it in right. And it's going to build, it just takes a few minutes. And if we do LS, we can see that we built this one. Our other one's gone. So to run that one, we would type period dot, because that's the current folder we're in, ham clock dash 1600 by 960. Oops. Now you see it's absolutely huge, and I can't really use it on this little display. So, but it does work. And I will go ahead and cancel that, kill that. I need to go back and build my regular sized one. Okay, LS to look at the directory. Now we can see our executable is ham clock. And we're right back to where we were. And there we are. I hope you like it. Appreciate Elwood for what you've done for the ham community releasing this. It's a great, great program, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot of use out of it. See you guys next time. Good looking clock there, and wasn't too bad to set up either. No, it was really easy, but it, it's a lot more functional than just that. I, I set it up because I used that computer, like I said, and having it handy right there is good. But if you want a standalone one, you can put it on a Pi Zero W or a zero if you've got a network connection and stick it on the back and have it when you boot up it just goes straight into that and it's dedicated just to run the clock and or you can build it on one of those little Arduino type devices with the Wi-Fi built in now, I've got a generic one but I don't have a display for it yet so I may revisit that sometime when I pick up a display and and make a standalone one out of the res out of the uh, Arduino device um, I think it's a ESP8266. I'm pretty sure it'll work on that. Um, I haven't tried it, but I think it will. If not, the uh, Adafruit one was really cheap anyway. But anyway, it's, it's a lot of functionality in there. There's more stuff than I showed. I just could only go for like 10 minutes or so. Um, but anyway. I think, you just, cool I think you just cut into Geocron's uh, sales. Uh, with that project it's way more informative just from what i just saw i mean it's way more informative than the uh pie clock it's still sitting over here which is pretty much just weather related um information so yeah it's that's a ham's clock yeah this is a ham clock uh, it's really not much weather stuff on there this is some temperature stuff and uh the phases of the moon but the weather forecast isn't on there at least i didn't run into it but uh it's pretty cool. I like it. I leave it running most of the time right there. Cool. That That is really nice looking. And like I was saying without saying earlier, I've got a stack of Raspberry Pis over here now that are not doing anything. So I should probably oh. repurpose one of those for that project. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, Nigel asked if it'll work on a Raspberry Pi 3. And while that's on a 4, yeah, it works just fine on a 3 as well. Matter of fact, it probably worked fine on, on almost any of them. Cool. All right. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment, but first we want to get a message from one of our fine sponsors. And I, I think we have a guest reader on this ad tonight. Are you looking for a tuner that's so plug-and-play that you'll barely notice it's there? The MFJ 939 is the tuner you've been looking for. With a plug-and-play cable to match your choice of radio, this versatile tuner can be connected to all modern or classic HF transceivers. This is truly a tuner that's easy to connect and easy to operate. On supported radios, it can tune your antenna automatically, so there's no need to do anything but enjoy your time on the air. To give you peace of mind, this tuner has an audible SWR meter that can give you instant feedback. This tuner can match your radio with antennas that have an SWR up to 32 to 1. That's a 50% wider matching range than competing products that are less capable and higher priced. It can tune your coax fed or random wire antennas from 1.8 to 30 megahertz using as low as 2 watts QRP to 200 watts single sideband or CW. Whether you're rag chewing or contesting, the MFJ 939 is learning your antenna and the way you operate by storing your settings in its 20,000 available memories. The more you use it, the better it will perform. For super fast matching, instant recall technology checks to see if you've used this frequency before, so tuning is instantaneous. Their exclusive virtual antenna memory system gives you 8 antenna memory banks of 2,500 memories each. By using an antenna switch, the MFJ 939 gives you the ability to assign an antenna to one of 8 banks of 2,500 memories. Got a new transceiver? There's no need to buy a new tuner like you have to with some competing products. Just get a plug-and-play cable for your radio, and you are back on the air in no time. To see the MFJ 939 and their full line of antenna tuners, visit MFJEnterprises.com today. And that sounds like an excellent idea. Tommy, have you ever hey, seen one of those tuners before? Wait, hold on a minute. Yeah, I just saw one. Okay. <laughs> I've got I've got one sitting right here. I absolutely love that thing, man. I, I couldn't even imagine not having it. It's, I, I went years and years and years with a manual tuner, and I got that thing. It's really spoiled me. Yeah. So you're an actual user. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm a believer, and I would recommend that one to anybody. Yeah, it's a nice, nice little auto tuner for sure, and you can get them for virtually any rig that's out there too. So. Uh, yeah, the, their price is really good on them, too. Yeah. Mike, there is a special project going on in Canada right now, I believe. I believe and, well, it's way over my head. Tell me, tell me a little bit about what's going on up there. I think it's, I think it's above all their heads. Although they haven't launched yet, I think the launch has been delayed, but... Uh, the Canadian Space Agency um, put together a project um, for all the post-secondary institutions, including all the provinces and territories, uh, for their students to take place in a real space mission, mission by designing and building and launching and operating their own miniature CubeSats. And there's uh, 15 in total, indicated by each of those red dots on the map there. And uh, interesting, uh, I had I had uh, an advanced uh, notice of this because um, cousin Jerry, aka uh, VE3EXT, was teaching a ham radio course uh, down in Windsor where he lives, and um, there was uh, quite a number of students from the University of Windsor, and uh, one of the stipulations for uh, being involved with the CubeSat project is that you had to uh, acquire or, or get your amateur radio license uh, so that you could operate it. Um, so that's what he did. He taught a course, um, and a number of the uh, students from the University of Windsor got their ticket uh, for, for that purpose, uh, for, for the uh, building and launching of their uh, CubeSat that, that they're uh, putting together. Any idea on the launch time? 
I think they've delayed it until the fall sometime. I don't know if they've picked an exact date yet or not. Cool. Well, keep us up to date on that. I would like to know how it goes. Yeah, it's interesting, and especially for uh, for Canada, I think it's one of the more ambitious projects. Um, we, we've had, I think, a couple of Oscar satellites over the years, but um, I think this is probably the biggest project that... Uh, that we've had uh, for for quite some time, so it's going to be interesting to see uh, with each of them uh, supports in terms of modes. I think there's more in information on the Canada Space Agency site and likely uh, likely on the AMSAT site as well. Cool. Well, I have an email here that uh, came from one of our friends we hear from quite frequently. I don't know if he's in the chat room tonight or not. It's uh, Elliot Eckerd. And this, let's see, when did he send this? Well, this past month, so it's not not very old yet. In the latest ALTV episode, you mentioned the Radio Shack radio you were using was made by Midland. I still have a Midland 2-meter rig, and he actually sent me a, a link, and I've got a photo of it right here. Uh, he uses oh, it. Oh, cool. For monitoring 146.52 or local nets at 146.58, since it does not have a PL board, it does not easily do odd splits. I suppose you could pick up a PL board. Well, you know, and as I mentioned, I didn't know that Midland ever made any 2-meter radios. And there's one right there. Well, that's an oldie but a goodie, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, it is. That's pretty cool. But Look, there's not a lot of those still in service. I bet it's not either. It looks like maybe the 14 is permanently affixed there. <laughs> and we've got a four-segment LED to read out the rest of the frequency. Like those old Radio Shack handy talkies. You remember those? They came with uh, CB channel 14 st in them. <laughs> really? I think. Yesu had a mobile that was like that. I think it was called the Channelizer, and um, possibly one of the one of the Heathkit uh, mobiles uh, had that as well, where they didn't display uh, the full frequency. Um, they were just uh, fake. The first couple of digits were uh, were one four, and then the rest were uh, seven segment displays. Speaking of cheap, oh. <laughs> oh. I'm surprised your headphones didn't fall off when your ears perked up. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about Cheap Preparation H, Emil? <laughs> well, it's, it's not, well, yeah, it, it's for external relief for sure. But anyway, so hurricane season is uh, predicted to be pretty active this year, and that's got all of us buzzing down here because... The Ham Club is uh, a lot of weather enthusiasts uh, in here in Slidell. And the Aries groups, obviously because of Katrina, Hurricane Katrina here, um, has got a lot of the Aries groups prepared and, and ready and doing things. So uh, I figured I'd go through and take the opportunity from Cristobal um, that just uh, came to us and get everything ready make sure things are working and seeing what i can do and you know as a ham so that's what my uh, preparation age is all about <laughs> yeah, amateur logic tv viewers ready or not hurricane season's here and down in the southeast here Louisiana uh, it's time to prepare for us uh, although we survived uh, tropical storm Cristobal that's always the early warning and preparedness uh, signal for us um, I prepared this presentation on preparation and some other topics that uh, it's time to perform uh, as far as preparation goes, you know, check those batteries, get on the air with your gear, test your generators, fuel up, and uh, make updates to your own plan, and check your supplies. 
Is you no good to nobody else if you you're not in good shape. So it's time to check those batteries. Make sure they're uh, still taking a charge. They actually work. Make sure you have spares and they work. Pull out that gear. Make sure it works. Field day is coming up. Perfect opportunity to do it if you haven't done it already. So get it on the air. Get it out. Make sure it all works. Check on your basic supplies and basic tools. Lots of good information at ready.gov for this in preparation on as far as what to get and how much, etc. There's been some additions to the KE5 QKR shack this year. I added a refurbished Dell Latitude with an attitude to run all of our uh, monitoring and servers and apps and SD. Uh, SDRs that I've acquired over some time so need some horsepower to run all that in the USB and SDR devices I've added a, an epic power gate to the uh, shack or the battery setup I have that'll take some solar panel inputs and just got to hook it all up make it work with the system so it'll seamlessly switch between the battery and power sources in normal conditions. I'm also running a Winlink VHF RMS packet gateway on the uh, Winlink system now from the shack serving our local DigiPeter hams within reach. As always if you want to stay current and find out what's happening out there there's plenty of software updates and plan updates from the different uh, governing bodies and software vendors for uh, many things whether it's modes frequencies and plans so update what you can see and communicate to the other hams around for instance many of our clubs update their sites websites with programming um, frequencies plans so there's plenty of information out on our side you just got to find where your local clubs put this information about what they're doing and uh, how up to date it is so that you can program your rigs and uh, systems I also attend um, our local clubs meeting and some other clubs around our area the greater New Orleans area and also the state has uh, their own site plus some uh, social media forums that I keep up with information on just to know what's going on for situational awareness. <laughs> There were some things in there that wasn't cheap certified, uh, as I'm seeing in the chat room. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I think I could probably pick out a few in there. But uh, timely as well, because we just went through a tropical storm here, as you mentioned. And, you know, that little storm created a lot more trouble for me at these radio stations here than I would have ever expected. Because it wasn't really that strong, but... No. Oh man! No, it was a lot of rain, though. Yep. Yep. I've had a lot of issues that I'm still not completely recovered from. So, um, uh, you get rain blowing from different directions and constantly, and you start seeing some problems. Yeah. Well, I think most of my problems were induced from the power grid. 
you know. And yeah, I have generators, but you know, stuff can happen before you ever switch to a generator. Uh, anyway, so y'all are ready. Bring on the big one now. Is that what you're saying? No, no. Oh. Yeah, we're ready. We're ready, but no. <laughs> okay, I don't blame you. I I just assume it's stay away too because if you get it, you know, it's going to be rough up here too. Exactly. Yeah, we don't want the leftovers either. No. <laughs> no. I'll wave as I pass by on I-55. That's for sure. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break and come right back because we've, we've still got more to go. So stand by while we take a message from our friends at ICOM. Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. The IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as you have base station features and functionality at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilo, or just over 2 pounds. With RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 5 watt battery operation with BP272 or 10 watts with a 13.8 volt DC supply. Modes include single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D star functions. A large 4.3 inch color touchscreen and live band scope with waterfall. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card for data storage, it comes standard with the HM243 speaker microphone, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the LC192 optional backpack, with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day in the park. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information about this and all the great ICOM radios. Just a little heads up there. That is a great rig, and we've actually seen it here before. Ray brought one over. It was actually a prototype back a few months, and yeah. we shot video on it. Well, Ray is going to be back here for field day, and we don't know exactly where we're going to do it yet, but we're going to set up, and we're not going to go in the tents and all this year because, well, obviously, um, probably not the best idea in the world at, at this particular time. But Ray is going to come over, and he's going to bring that rig along with some, some neat antenna options. And we're going to set it up and work a little field day from outside somewhere. I just hope we don't have thunderstorms that day and the temperature is somewhere <laughs> below 100 degrees with it, you know, less than 100% humidity. That so, would be nice. That would be nice. But not very likely. I have an announcement here. This actually came from David, K-A-8-Z-G-E, Ziggy. He wanted to let everyone know that the Van Wert Amateur Radio Club is going to have their 33rd annual Ham Fest. It is still scheduled, and uh, they are planning on holding it. It's going to be Sunday, July 19th, 2020, at the Van Wert County Fairgrounds on Washington Street in Van Wert. Free admission this year. They will have a donation jar there, so you can drop in a donation if you'd like. Many ham fest have canceled, but things have eased up, and working with officials, we will have one. Just follow the social distancing guidelines. We will have hand sanitizer available. Thanks for that announcement, David. Mike, I understand congratulations are in order. You've received a major award. Yes. My oh, one and only. I just couldn't resist taking advantage of the uh, the Hamvention QSO party, uh, which issued participation certificates. And uh, I actually got mine sent to me uh, by uh, Tim Duffy, uh, K3LR. Um, so any of 
any of you people that uh, managed to work in that contest and posted your score to 3830scores.com, you can uh, request your certificate. That's my one and only paper for the wall. Nice. Yeah. I, well, that's I, I not guess, a leg lamp, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> I was I was pretty surprised because I, I made one single contact and because the contact I made happened to be one of the uh, the Dara stations, I got a, a bonus uh, ten bonus points, so it brought my score to eleven. So, <laughs> so there's there's some prosperity there, um, and I was I was actually surprised when I checked the scores because I thought I oh here here's Mike he's going to be dead last in the lineup, and I'm like. 30th from the bottom or something like that <laughs> so it just goes to show you it's it's not all about the numbers it's about having fun well well i i had one single contact too and i did not apply for the award but i didn't i didn't wouldn't have got the bonus point so i would have been much further down the list than you mike i i couldn't touch <laughs> your your score there anyway that was a lot of fun and uh i guess uh Thanks to uh, to Tim and everybody else who uh, put that that together as kind of a consolation prize for uh, Hemvention uh, 2020 having to be canceled this year. Yeah, yeah, that was, that's pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. Well, it is time for my segment. You know, it has been an interesting month. It's been an interesting <laughs> spring, actually, but. You know, I've been working on that Echo Link project, trying to get a squelch signal out of a rig to connect to the RS-232 port on a computer. And I've had it working twice with different circuits that I put together. And it it's they're working just fine. Everything is great till you put it on the air a few days and then you discover, oops, that, that's not working out like I hoped it would. So here is my latest incarnation of Tap That Squelch. And <laughs> I, I, this one is working great. Oh, we'll talk more you about it. You might remember after. in last month's show, I showed you how to tap that squelch. We were using an old Radio Shack HTX 212 rig with Echo Link and needed a way to get a squelch signal out of it. I had tried two different methods to do this, first using a transistor. That worked partially, but not reliably. Then I used a hex inverter, two stages of it, and that seemed to be working okay, although the RS-232 signal is not the same as a TTL level signal. It seemed like it was going to work. After a while, we had issues with it. So now here's my third incarnation, and this is really how I should have started out. I knew about this chip and had a few surface mount ones that had been given to me, and I was just trying to avoid using the surface mount chips because that can be kind of difficult when you don't have a board to put it on. Nevertheless, that's what it took to pull this off. Here's a photo of the Max 232 CWE version. For size reference, I'm showing it beside a 5-volt regulator that's in a TO220 case. Now, that's a 16-pin chip, so you can see it's pretty small. Now, let's talk about why I had problems and my hex inverter circuit wouldn't work. You know, TTL, and for the most part, CMOS, operate with a 1 or a 0, a high or a low signal. The low signal is typically between 0 and 0.4 volts and a high, depending on the supply voltage, which typically might be 5 volts, is going to be between 2.4 and 5 volts. And that's about what I had coming out of the hex inverter. The voltages of an RS-232 signal are quite different. They range between plus 3 to plus 15 on one end. In the other direction, it's from minus 3 to minus 15. So you can see why my narrow swing of 5 volts or less just wasn't cutting it. I needed to convert that TTL signal up to RS-232 levels. 
Fortunately, there's a range of chips out there made just for that. It was created by Maxim years ago. It is called a Max 232 chip. And the beauty of this thing is it only takes a single polarity supply. You can operate it all 5 volts because it has charge pump circuits built in that use capacitors to create the higher negative and positive voltages. There's a number of different versions of the MAX-232 available today. They're sometimes called an RS-232 driver and receiver. Other times you might see them listed as RS-232 level converters. This is a circuit I'll use in the HTX-212. The hex inverter on the left is a holdover from what I did last time. And I had two sections of that inverter in there so that the signal going in would be the same as the signal coming out. In other words, when I had a high, it indicated squelch open, and then that's what I would get out on pin 4. I'm adding the MAX-232 to that. You can see I'm going in the TTL CMOS input on pin 10 there. And coming out on pin 7 and going on to the serial port CTS, I've inserted this chip in series with a hex inverter. I still needed the hex inverter because you can see in the MAX-232 that all the inputs and outputs are inverters themselves. So I needed two stages of inversion to maintain the correct output. A high in gives me a high out. Now if you look at pin 1 and 3 and pin 4 and 5, you'll see two capacitors there. Those are one microfarad capacitors. Those are for the charge pumps. And one is actually a voltage doubler, they call it. It steps it up from 5 volts to plus 10 for when we need that. The other is a voltage inverter. It steps it down to minus 10. And there's another cap there on pin 6. That's a 1 microfarad as well. And so is C3 up there on pin 2. That's a 1 microfarad. And C5 coming in on the 5 volt line at pin 16. That's all there is to this. I'm only using one of the four sections that are in the MAX-232 because that's really all I need. And this seems to be working better because before when I only had a zero or a plus five for high going into the CTS pin of the serial port, it wasn't quite as effective that uh, sometimes we'll get false indications. The MAX-232 CWE chips that I had, of course, are a 16-pin surface mount chip very small there, kind of difficult to add circuitry to. I decided to use a modified dead bug style. That's where you put the chip upside down and you connect the components to the lead sticking out the bottom of the chip, which are now on top. I had five different one microfarad capacitors that I had to connect here, so they're all over the place. There's a couple on top, a couple on the bottom, and one out the side. And you can see I put some little jumper leads there too that will connect down to my hex inverter board. This is the best I could do with what I had because I didn't have a PC board that that chip would fit. I mostly just wanted to get this going, test it out, and make sure that this in fact would cure the problem that I was having. You can see my bundle of heat shrink unshrunk tubing it's laying over here now because there was no longer room to fit it in this other side. Inside we've got the same hex inverter chip that we had before. But we've tacked on our MAX-232 and all five capacitors right here on top of that board. I'm just going to button this back up and we'll run it like this. Although I have ordered some dip versions of that chip, that'll make this much easier to do in the future. Well, there you go, and this one seems to be working. The problem I was having using the hex inverter is, well, like I said there in the video, you know, TTL and CMOS levels are from uh, 0 volts up to plus 5 volts for a high. And RS-232 port is not that at all. The, all you know, you're talking about levels between, oh, it, you've got to have positive and negative voltages 
4RS232. I couldn't get by with the zero volts there. So when I use this little converter here, man, I think that has solved it because I was getting some some fault squelch indications from from the hex inverter chip alone, and this solved it. I mean, it's five volts in, and you get both polarities coming out of it, and you get the little uh, hex inverter buffers in there as well. And yeah, it was kind of difficult to work with, but I had I had the surface mount chips. Yeah. And so that's why I did it. I wanted to prove that yeah, this will work before I order any parts. I like that you used what you had. Yeah. You, you the dead bug modified method. And they were free. There you go. They were given to me by um I've got it written on this piece of tape here from Scott N4JN yeah I believe he is in Huntsville and he saw that I was talking about needing some of those and he sent these to me so I was yep. I was mighty proud to get them he's got a lot of them that's the well, that was nice of him yeah that's the 16 pin surface mount chip right there this is the equivalent in a dip version, 16 pins. You can see there's a fair amount of difference in the size. There's really a lot of difference in the size of the pins and the spacing. You know, that's, uh, I don't have any PC boards at that pitch, so there's no way I could have put it on a board. And with a dip, I can put this on a little piece of strip board and make that work out. And here, for just for scale, there is one of the one microfarad capacitors that I was using. I had five of those. So anyway, I've got to build another one of these now. I think I'm going to stick with the one I built in that Radio Shack rig there because it seems to be working fine. And as long as nobody opens up the rig and starts squashing on that printed circuit board there, I should be okay with it. But I am going to build up this uh, dip version here. You know, I ordered six of those from DigiKey. They were cheap enough. I'm going to build up one using that. I'm going to put it in the uh, other rig, the um, I think that was a Yaesu FT2500M for our other Echo Link node that I'm trying to link the two together. Because it, it worked great here on the bench uh, using the hex inverter. But as soon as I took it and put it in the field, it immediately didn't work so uh, and I th I'm pretty sure that's the reason why right there you just can't get away with trying to use TTL to do RS-232 okay we're going to be right back and I hope that's all I'm going to talk about squelches and modifying <laughs> radios for some time to come because it's uh, don't squelch that topic uh, yeah I'm, I'm ready to be <laughs> done with that project <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> At the end of each month, it's Amateur Logic's Ham College, the new show for those new to the hobby and those wanting to get into amateur radio. Which of the following is a purpose of the amateur radio service as stated in the FCC rules and regulations? That inductor and capacitor form a tuned circuit. That's how you tune the radio to the frequency that you want. The English language. We lived in town. I liked it. I, I listened to mine a lot. It was really cool because you didn't have to have a battery to power yeah. There's our homemade telegraph station. We can use it for long distance communications. Oh, like, uh, what, three feet yeah, here? Across the table. The answer is B. Voltage was named after Italian physicist Alessandro Volta. We can see we're generating a little bit of electricity there. It's DC. It's always great to go back and get a refresher. It well, sure is. A lot of that stuff, if you've been a ham for a while like we have, you, you don't really think about a lot of that stuff that often. They didn't have electric screwdrivers in those days, so that's why we're not using one. That's why we went primitive with it. Yeah. So let's see if we can hear anything when we, uh, we fire off our spark gap transmitter. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't build anything or blow up anything today, but 
The oh. night's still young. My eyebrows are just starting to come back in, too, from that. <laughs> yeah. that transmitter. I think I need to update that promo a little. When, when I put that together, the show was brand new, and now we've done, what, 50-something episodes of it. So yeah, yeah, all the way, all the way on the extra. And yeah, we're in the extra pool now, and let me tell you, that is a deeper pool, for sure. <laughs> it's a deep pool, all right. Yeah, <laughs> you you want? Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of those shows, and and uh, 144 of these I saw. Uh, who was it? Uh, oh, W1CAH in the uh, chat room mentioned that this going to be the 15th year coming up in October this year 15th anniversary man that's a that's a pretty big milestone it is we're gonna have, we're gonna have that party and actually we've we've had 65 episodes of ham college I n- never would have thought that it was that far along but I guess we've been doing it longer than I realized it's so much fun it just goes yeah. right by you yeah. don't even realize yeah. it only seems like a couple of years for him college anyway yeah I mean I, I can still almost smell the corona arc from that spark gap sitting right here <laughs> I can still feel it yeah and it's been it's been a whole lot of cheap yeah well, Tommy you mentioned one ARRL event earlier tonight I think you've got yep, some information uh, on another one. I do have some. Uh, actually, uh, Alan Clark posted a link in the Facebook group from the AWRL. Um, there's a, a it's a field day notice. It says uh, every radio club should watch this video. The coronavirus can't stop amateur radio from doing what we do best, says Mitch Hopper, K9ZXO. In the video, you'll find answers to these questions. What is field day? Um, how are radio amateurs and clubs doing to adapt their participation for COVID-19? And so forth. Anyway, go to that link right there and read up on it and watch the video. It's pretty interesting. Uh, field day's coming up in a few weeks, as we mentioned. And uh, everybody needs to, you know, take the proper precautions. I hate to keep keep saying it, but it's, it's just true, so... You know, take the proper precautions and think of others. And uh, anyway, check out the video. The guys really did a really nice job on it, and you can find it on that link, the yeah. AWRL site. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to doing it. It won't be the full weekend uh, heat marathon like we normally do, but uh, yeah, we're going to have a good time well, nevertheless. Well. Yeah, it's a little. We don't have enough air conditioners for separate tents, and probably not the best idea to share tents these days. So, um, do Saturday, and then I'm gonna do something both days. You know, might not camp, um, but I'm definitely gonna be on the air for both days somehow. Yeah. May do that, and then I may come back and run it here because they changed a lot of the rules for this year. Yeah. And it just occurred to me, you know, we're going to have Ray, and and depending on where we go, but we could have Ray out in the woods with that 705. We might have a better chance of getting that radio from him. (laughs) We might. (laughs) Well, if if what's in those if what's in those woods uh, from some of our segment is there, yeah, you might be able to use that as some leverage. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we might be able to take those cans of deviled ham and bait them with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we really. I'm, a, I'm looking forward to seeing that 705 in action and playing around with it. I'm telling you, that's more than likely going to be my next radio, and uh, I'm really looking forward to playing with it hands on. Yeah. yeah this that. is a good opportunity for uh, for ha- like wannabe hams that don't have their their license. Um, especially with the band conditions being what they have been, at being at the bottom of the cycle. Um, there's nothing like uh, the uh, ARRL hand, um, field day to light up the bands. So if, if, mm. if you want to do some listening, if you've got a receiver, that's a good time to turn it on because I'm sure you'll hear lots of activity that you would normally wouldn't hear on the HF bands, especially oh. this time. Uh, Absolutely. They're gonna, they'll be packed. Yeah. And 
you should find out if you've got a club in your area and check them out, you know, because you'll meet a lot of nice folks and maybe get some some useful information. Yeah, you know, the, the one thing I like about the rules and the way it's structured, you know, since it's not really a contest, um, there the rules are really written well to m- if you if you want to learn something new, it doesn't matter which license class you're at either. If you want to learn something new and figure out how to operate something, there's a great opportunity to get the points to do it. But you're learning to do it, it the the way it's structured. You know, you're actually going to you do something useful if you uh, are successful with it and follow through. So that's why I like it so much. Yeah, and I would I would echo what Mike said. Um, you know, you you may not be hearing anything on the bands at all with the way they are right now, but on field day that weekend, you will be hearing traffic. Even if the bands are completely dead, you're going to hear traffic. It's so, inevitable. Yep. So all you need to do is throw a piece of wire out in the yard, too, and hook it up to something. Yep. True. I remember my first field day, and I wasn't even licensed then, and... Um, I think I stayed up for the whole event 24 hours straight, and I think I came home and slept for 14 <laughs> after that. It was yeah. such a rush. Yeah. You know, if if you needed to look sharp for field day, like... What do you mean if? When you need to look sharp for field day, there you, you, go. you might want a shirt similar to the one I'm modeling right here. Yeah, and I was going to compliment you on that. You do look extra sharp, and Mike as well. I'm feeling sharp, too. If you want to look sharp for field day, it's not really a want to. You kind of have to. <laughs> um, anyway, you can go to amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com, and we've got insulated cups, mugs, shirts, cap. If you live way up north, we got sweatshirts, but you're probably not going to need those this time of the year, maybe for winter field day. So there's a lot of swag on there that we did not used to have. So anyway, go check it out at amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com. If that weather keeps up, if it's cool uh, uh, field day weekend, I might need that uh, Amateur Logic uh, crew neck sweater that I've got. I may have to pull it out. Yeah, I mean. Well, Mike, you know, it's, it's only going to be cool if you're there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, let's go around and see what everyone's going to be up to here between now and the next episode. Tommy, what have you got on the agenda? Well, I, I don't want to give it away, but uh, it's I've got a pretty cool project. It's very different from anything I think we've done on here hmm. yet. And, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to finish it myself. I'm going to try to finish it this weekend have a little time but uh anyway look for, look for that i think you're gonna like it it should be a lot of fun yeah uh, i'm gonna be uh, gearing up for phil day here and trying to and working with tommy trying to decide where we're gonna do it because ray is coming over with that rig and and we want to have a uh, a good place to do that at and uh, we'll we'll figure it out because I don't know about the woods yet. You know, we haven't cleared that site yet. Don't know if that's going to be a good location for us this year or not, but we'll find out. Email. What are you? Well, it sounds like preparing. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> I'm prepared. <laughs> prepared for. Well, it sounds like we're all on the same page. We're preparing for field day, and that's about right because our our club tried to do. And, and um, get some locations from the parks, kind of like a parks on the air type thing. And it, it's not panning out all that well for field day. Um, still a lot of people shy about getting out there. So we might do a coordinated uh, central logging Google type thing or and, and run from everybody's QTH and do that maybe over Zoom or something else. So that's what we're looking at. Well, and they, you know, they've changed the rules on field day for this year, and that is allowed. So, yep. You know, that's that's not uh, really a, a bad idea at all. Mike? 
Well, I was thinking about maybe um, pulling the camper out, and uh, if it's not too windy, uh, they just opened up our uh, parks. So I was thinking maybe I could take the camper there, set up and, and work field day from there if uh, weather is accommodating. If not, I can always just set it up in the driveway and uh, run from there. Cool. That sounds like a lot That'd of fun. That'd be good. Yeah. Well, do you know what we're going to be doing now? And we'll be talking about it as as it occurs. And we'd like to know what you're going to be talking about, too. Where can you catch up with us during the month, Emil? Oh, 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 I know. Oops. Um, I'll, I'll start from the bottom. Groups.io slash G slash amateur logic, amateur logic is a great place to start. Oh, where's another, Mike? Uh, there's facebook.com slash groups slash amateur logic TV. And what if you just yeah. needed like instant satisfaction, Tommy? Where? Well, you would you would really want to go to Twitter for that, and that would be at Amateur Logic. It's not on there, but we also have an Instagram account, and uh, it's not we don't post to it very often. Uh, usually at a ham fest or something like that. But I would look for some field day pictures on the Instagram Amateur Logic account too, if you use that. Okay. And we've got a wiki, too. <laughs> as a matter of fact, our wiki monster is back in action again. I uh, glad to hear that Dan N9LVS, that things are going well now. And, uh, wow, it's, this is where you can get your show notes. You can find out what we talked about on the different episodes. Uh, any links that we might want to share on there as well, just to get your show notes right there, amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. And I believe that is all I've got for tonight. What about you guys? Anything else we need to discuss before we go? Yeah, I was just going to mention that I saw somebody else mention it in the uh, chat room, but I actually had a little note on here to bring it up, but the if you didn't see the post, the Huntsville Ham Fest was canceled for this year. Yeah. Um, so we won't be making that one. So hopefully everything will be back to normal by next year. So it's been been a pretty bad year for Ham Fest, uh, among other things. But uh, anyway, just want to pass that out there. Yeah. On that on that note, um, a friend of mine was telling me about a Ham Fest in uh, I think he mentioned it was Batavia, New York. Uh, it's an outdoor uh, ham fest, so uh, they're running with it, and it's uh, it's in July. So I think the only ham fests that are having an issue uh, maintaining the safe distancing is is uh, venues that are inside or have indoor buildings. But uh, there are the there is the odd uh, ham fest that uh, is strictly outside. So um, those ones, um, well, like if if the one Tommy mentioned in the the one my friend was mentioning in New York is any indicator then you know there's there's obviously more outdoor flea markets around and uh, just keep an eye on the list yeah. and hopefully uh, there'll be a go I was gonna bring this out earlier but I got uh, one of the viewers I, he's actually in the chat room sent me uh, oh yeah oh, oh nice the case too nice. yeah I got the leather case and everything and it, it's it looks great so Anyway, I really appreciate that. It's uh, it's uh, very nice. I can't wait to use it. Just I haven't had much time. I played around with it, and then we went on vacation, and uh, so I'm planning on looking that over really good this weekend. But uh, anyway, you know what? Every every ham. I know there's all kinds of neat uh, digital uh, multimeters, are, but you still need a you, you know every once in a while. That good old analog meter is is the thing to use. It's the right tool for the job. Yep. Yep. You need both. And uh, Simpson 260 is one of those kind of meters that if you've got one, it, you're going to keep it. You know, you you won't be getting rid of it. Uh, it yeah, I was pretty happy when I when I got that. That's really nice. But but each has their own purposes. You know, some things a digital meter is much better for but other things can't beat a good analog meter well i guess we're going to call it a show and we'll see everyone back here around the middle of july um 
you can catch Dean Martin and Professor Thomas at the end of the month for the next time college. We'll be catch some good buzzer action. Yeah, <laughs> we we have done that. We decided with the extra pool that we should have more buzzers going off during the show. You know. Um, yeah, the yeah. vote was unanimous on that. Yeah, and it's a good thing too because <laughs> <laughs> they are they're harder questions, uh, but still doable. So, yeah, seven three everyone, join us again at the end of next month, and stay safe and have a good field day. Yeah, seven three. Seven three. Seven three. The latest ALTV episode, you mentioned the Radio Shack Razor. I'm going to say that again. That Radio Shack didn't have razors that I know of. <laughs> and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> no, not very likely. I mean, it is field day after all. You know, that's... <laughs> I, I think I got an amen on that. I, th I think they must be looking for a hat. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. What do you, why do you want my two cents? What do you want my two cents for, Mike? Actually, uh, I don't know. If Tommy and George don't know about it, but uh, there was a new feature added in. I noticed uh, when, when Skype updated to the latest version this afternoon... Uh, you can send or receive payments, and I requested two cents from the cheap old man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is this? Yeah. This is a big old blue thing saying he wants my two cents. That's kind of like a pipe dream, Mike. <laughs> He'll never and see I, that. I, 